For more on the growing prospects for a civil war in Syria, we turn to Andrew Tabler of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He lived in Syria for most of the last decade, and he founded an English language magazine there. And Mona Yakubian, she lived in Syria as a Fulbright scholar during the mid-1980s. During the 1990s, she was an analyst at the State Department and is now with the Stimson Center, a Washington research organization. Andrew Tabler, who are the rebels? Well, there, there, there is the um, the civilian uh, opposition, of course. The the ones who are you're seeing concerning the attacks, that's those are the Free Syrian Army and their affiliates, and those include um, defectors from the Syrian Army uh, who went to Turkey, uh, defectors from the Syrian Army who now operate within the country uh, with the opposition, and then sort of local uh, FSA affiliates, um, which is sort of like the equivalent of, of of sort of Minutemen during the American Revolution who carve out protest space and protect protesters, and they are increasingly carrying out attacks against the Assad regime um, throughout the country. Mona Yacoubi, and whenever we have seen uh, yet another regime fall or at least attempt to be overthrown, we've seen these rebels spring up, but how do we know they're not fighting each other? Well, we haven't had reports of rebels fighting each other at this point in Syria, but it's also clear that there's no centralized command and control, and that the situation on the ground, frankly, appears to be getting increasingly chaotic, as noted by your report. Is there a sectarian split that's at work here? Clearly, there's a sectarian uh, issue at play in Syria today. Uh, the, the regime is, is an Alawite regime that's a minority regime. Uh, the rebels are largely Sunni. And so we're seeing increasingly that the, the battles on the ground take on a sectarian character. We've had massacres, for example, uh, in the recent weeks of uh, civilians, largely Sunni. And it is alleged that uh, government paramilitary forces that are Alawite, the same sect as the president, have undertaken those attacks. So clearly, there's a sectarian dimension to the violence in Syria, and it appears to be growing. Andrew Tabler, there's been much discussion on uh, here in, in Washington about what the U.S. or other countries should do to remove Assad. But where do we think the money is coming from or the aid is coming from to help that happen by supporting these, these rebel groups? Uh, the money's coming from the Arab Gulf. Um, Qatar and Saudi Arabia's names are often uh, put forward, as well as that of Turkey. Um, the exact trail is, is unclear, but the, 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 the kind of weapons that are in, they're entering Syria are growing increasingly sophisticated, it seems. Um, there is a lot more light arms. And, um, and the, the kind of opposition that the, that the FSA is putting across to the regime is, is increasingly effective. It's this game of what they call whack-a-mole, uh, like the carnival game where elite divisions try to go into areas, reassert their control. They do so temporarily. They have to go somewhere else and chase them all. Um, and then, of course, the protesters and the armed elements come back up in those areas. And that's why the regime is resorting to shelling, resorting to helicopter gunships, and the situation is worsening and more people are dying. So, so the regime is frustrated in a way be, uh, with this whack-a-mole strategy, but is the kind of support that these uh, rebel groups are having, are, are getting from outside Syria, is it enough to overthrow the regime? Well, it can certainly wear it down, um, but the, the Russians and the Iranians continue to resupply the regime. So they can, you know, the regime can hold on for some time, but not hold on like it did before, like sort of like the regime uh, did in Algeria in the 90s. But of course, unlike Algeria, it's not at the center of the Middle East. It doesn't have all that oil revenue. Um, and of course, you have a lot of the rebels receiving a lot of support from the outside. So we're in for a very, very long fight in Syria uh, in the coming months and perhaps even years. Mona Yakubian, so far the United States' role has been lit limited to non-lethal aid, and there has been no effort to get on the, in, the, in the battle directly. But should there be more? Is there more that the U.S. can be doing or that we know that they are doing? I think given the chaotic situation on the ground inside Syria, it does not make sense to either arm the rebels or undertake broader military intervention. I think we're looking at a situation that is increasingly unpredictable. It would be very difficult, for example, to uh, assert that arms are getting in the right hands. There are increased reports of jihadist elements that have made their way uh, into the Syrian arena. Um, my own sense is I think the U.S. needs to continue on a diplomatic track. Uh, Andrew Tapler, on the other side, the flip side of this, you're shaking your head. You don't agree that the diplomatic track is a good idea? Well, the diplomatic track's not working. It doesn't mean that we have to abandon it, but it's just not working. The Anand plan is not working. The Russians are not bending yet. I, I agree with Mona that I think we should continue, but Plan B, supporting the opposition within Syria, has us getting the hope of Plan A. 
Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't really see the Russians bending. Um, now, uh, regardless of all of this, I think we're, we're very limited in how we can affect the outcome. This hurricane is gathering uh, on the eastern Mediterranean, and I really don't know what we can do to stop it. We can deal with the effects of it. Uh, but the most important thing is that is for the United States to achieve uh, President Obama's policy objective of getting President Assad to step aside. If the Russians want to help us with that, that's great. Um, if not, we have to prepare for that and, and prepare an alliance that will achieve that objective. Mona Yakubian, how does this compare to what we have been through, have seen, have watched in places like Libya and places like Egypt, in which uh, opposition rose up, removed someone from power, and then it wasn't really clear what the next step was? Well, this is so much more of a protracted situation, certainly, than what we've seen in Egypt and even in Libya. Um, the opposition is still in a state of disarray. It doesn't hold any territory firmly. There's no Syrian Benghazi, for example. And the opposition has remained uh, often, you know, at, at odds within itself. There have been all kinds of rivalries inside the Syrian opposition. Um, so it's been a very, it's a much more difficult situation, I think, for foreign intervention. Um, the, the one point I would, I would sort of push back on with Andrew is, in some ways, we may very well be at that tipping point into uh, a, a long and drawn-out sectarian civil war. And this may be the last best chance for diplomacy. It may well be that the Russians and the United States come together and work out a plan that, in fact, puts Syria on a track toward a more stable transition. And Andrew Tabler, finally, what do, do you see uh, that there is a successor, perhaps, uh, in line? Or is there any clear plan if some, suddenly this non-lethal aid were to work and the rebels were to triumph? Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet. I mean, you, you'd have to, if you really want to put a Yemen kind of plan in, in, in place, you have to think about who could step into that. I don't think that we're close to that uh, situation. Um, the, the, the problem is that it seems like this regime is going to go very, very bloodily. And, um, and I hope that there is a negotiated uh, transition in Syria. But the, the, the handover of power, because it's a minority-dominated regime, it makes it resilient against those kind of splits. Trying to convince the military, for example, to oust the Assad family, I think will be extremely difficult, mm. even if the Russians decide to really throw their weight behind the idea. Andrew Tabler of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and Mona Yakubian of the Stimson Center. Thank you both very much.